good morning and welcome. I've struggled for the last several weeks simply because this is a time where our congregation is making a choice that will decide this decision, uh, the direction of our church for the months to come. My prayer is, because I've been aware of some things that have been happening from those who are in favor and those who are opposed both, but my prayer is that each of us are seeking God's leadership and not simply the influence of a friend or someone else. Secondly, if the only reason you have come today is to vote, after you've cast your ballots, I would invite you to go home because we're not here about voting. We're here about worshiping God. And that's my one true thing. And if somebody's here that does not want to worship, it will affect all the rest of us. I've struggled to, whether to say these things or not, but they just have been on my heart for several days. And so vote as God leads you, yay or nay but don't do it because someone has told you to. At this time, I'll turn it over to Brenda Ellis as our moderator.
Just a few quick announcements. Um, rather than Wednesday night this week, we're meeting on Thursday. We'll go ahead and have time of fellowship and food. You bring your own from 5.30 to about 6.25. Uh, then we'll have our study this week. It's on uh, two hymns and remembrance and Jesus at your holy table. We will partake of the Lord's Supper on Thursday evening. We will also partake next Sunday morning as well. Jesus didn't say how often, but he said as often as you do, take in remembrance of me. So hopefully you'll be able to be at least one of those. Right after the service today, there's going to be an Easter egg hunt for the children. Uh, they'll go to the Family Life Center where lunch and crafts will be provided, as well as an opportunity to perhaps find some eggs. Next Sunday is Easter, uh, which means that the schedule's a little different. We'll have the sunrise service at 7 a.m. at the uh, lake. Followed by that, following that, we'll have breakfast about 8.15 or so in our Family Life Center. Uh, if you plan to come, uh, let's go ahead and get a show of hands here, but also, if you don't know today, please let the office know by Wednesday. Somebody asked me to have y'all raise your hands, but I can't count. If you would, do me a favor, if you're coming, contact the church office Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Sunday school and worship will be at the regular times. Some of you have asked, the memorial service for Edna Yates uh, will be on April 21st at 2 p.m. here in our sanctuary. Prior to that, there will be visitation from 1 to 2 in the Family Life Center. Lots of other announcements in your uh, worship guides. Please uh, read those and take advantage of those that, meet you, uh, that you can participate in. And now I ask that we turn our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to worship as we enter this time with our instrumental prelude, followed by our prayer of invocation, and then our spoken call to worship. And I apologize.
Dennis, would you come and lead our prayer, please, sir? Would you come and lead the prayer, please? Would you go with me in prayer at this time? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day and the opportunity we have to be here in your house. Lord, be with us, be with our hearts and our minds. Pray that we seek to do your will at all times and that you'll guide and direct us, Lord. We thank you for everyone gathered here today we thank you while we're reaching the point where most everyone can come out now and be here on Sunday services. We offer our prayers up to those who still are not able to be here. But be with them, Lord, whatever the problem may be. Touch them with your healing hand and nourish them back to us. We thank you again, Lord. Most of all, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Trey Combs, if you're able, please stand for our call to worship. Good morning. I will be reading our call to worship, True Greatness. God, on the final Sunday of Lent, Help us learn the lessons that Jesus taught his disciples. Lord, help us not be like the disciples, wanting to be the most important. Father, help us see that greatness is not based on power or position. Lord, help us see to be different from the world's ways. Father, teach us that true greatness is found in the desire to serve others. Lord, help us to remember. Father, give us a spirit of service so that others can see Jesus through us. Lord, give us the courage to share love by serving others. Father, thank you for showing us how to be truly great. Amen. Now if you'll join me as we sing Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. children are welcome to come at this time for the children's message.
Good morning. Don't worry, I have three helpers waiting. <laughs> You're right, Joan, I am going to need it. <laughs> well, good morning. Y'all have heard of the Last Supper. Have you heard of the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples? What do you think they talked about? You know what they talked about at the Last Supper? What? Worshiping God? Well, one of the questions that the disciples had is, who was the greatest? Now, who do we think is the greatest? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, but in the world today that's alive on earth today, who do we think is the greatest? Any of those people? Yes. Yes? You recognize some of those people? Yes. Le- okay, LeBron James is up there. Michael Jordan. No, they're basketball. Muhammad Ali is in the middle. You know, Muhammad Ali used to tell people he was the greatest. So, and for those who don't know, GOAT stands for the greatest of all time. So these are the greatest athletes of all, all time. Mm-hmm. Well, the S is plural because there's, there's a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these are people that today people think are the greatest, right? And they may, there may be musicians out there and actors and actresses that we think are the greatest too. But at the Lord's Supper, the disciples were wanting to know who did Jesus think was the greatest? And you know what Jesus told them? What? It's not the people that are up high that are making all the money or making all the decisions. Yeah, I would think it would be God. It is God, yeah. but it's also it's the example that Jesus gave, which he served others. One of the other things that he did at the Lord's Supper is he washed their feet. And that's not something that a king would do, is it? No, not normally. That's what the servants do. And so that's what Jesus was telling them is that they needed to be a servant in order to be the greatest. And that's what he's still telling us today is that we need to be a servant. And that's how we will be the greatest. And that's how we will show our love um, for God. So I want you all to remember that even though there's people um, in the world today that we think are great because they're good at something, um, that really what makes us great is when we serve others and we show them love. Okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these children. We thank you for their parents and grandparents that have brought them today. Lord, we thank you for the example that you gave us in being a servant and help us to be a servant to others. In your name we pray and we love you, Lord. Amen. As the children are going out, if you'll stand with me once again, we'll sing Great is the Lord.
as I shared with you, it's been about a year and a half since I've worn the same tie. However, I've worn all my Easter ties, so I had to go to the mask, and I love this one. A lot can happen in three days, and indeed it can, can it? Let's join together for our time of prayer. God, as we bow before you, I thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity of coming to worship you. To truly be able to sing from our hearts that you are great and that you are worthy to be praised. And I pray, Lord, that we would not just sing that as a hymn in church, but that it would be on our tongues and in our hearts all the time as we recall all the many things that you have done for us. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct us through this hour, that all we say, all we do will glorify and honor your name. But Lord, we also come to you to lift up those of our church family who have needs. I pray, Lord, for Miss Edna Yates' family during this time of loss. Even though we know that she is better off and we can celebrate her life, still we mourn for our loss and our hurt. And I pray, Lord, that you might give her family your, your love and presence during this time. Lord, we continue to pray for Chris, as she, Chris Emery as she awaits a date for surgery, and we pray, Lord, that it'll be very soon. But in the meantime, we continue to pray that you might have your hand upon her in such a way that some of the pain that she has consistently uh, dealing with, that you might remove some of that for her. And God, we continue to pray for others of our church family. We pray, pray for Miss Virginia Minor who fell last Sunday after church. And I pray, Lord, that you might be with her in the healing of her ankle that was fractured and that you might heal the bruises and bumps that she had experienced as well. And Lord, I pray that you might give wisdom to the specialist as to what he will do with her ankle. Continue to be with those of our church family who are recovering from surgery and other situations in their life. Be with Teresa Craig, Raina Lester, Brenda Adcock, Carmel Clapp, Joanne Fields, Marshall Dixon, Frank Marsanowski, and one of our members who has an unspoken request that he has shared with me, but I'm not at liberty to share with others, but thank goodness you know. And I pray that you might be with each of these. And Father, we continue to pray for family members as well. Continue to be with Harvey Bishop's son and his family during this time. And we pray, Lord, if it could be possible that you might have healing upon the child. But if healing can't take place, we pray, Lord, that the surgeries that will need to be undergone, that they will work and help this child to have a good and fulfilling life. Continue to be with Miss Virginia Minor's son, Bobby Loving, as he recovers from the procedure he had on his heart. Tim Davis's cousin, Kathy Duke, as she continues to deal with the brain aneurysm that she has experienced. With David Askew's brother, Bobby, who is at Wake Forest at Baptist Hospital, dealing with liver failure with Tammy Bishop's mother, Nancy, as she recovers from the procedure done on her heart, Gail Birdsong's grandson-in-law-to-be, John Hunter, as he is a young man who's experienced three heart attacks and a stroke in recent days. And I pray, Lord, that you might be with him, his fiancée, and all of Gail's family during this time. Continue to be with Richard Ir Urine, urine as he recovers, and also JD, Judy Yates' brother, Frank Halliman, as he deals with late-stage colon cancer. Father, continue to be with those of our church family who are homebound. I pray, Lord, that during this holy season that we might, as their, their church family, be your hands and your feet to let them know that you care and that you love them. We also pray for those who are in nursing homes, be with each one of them, and I pray, Lord, that they also will feel your presence and love. 
And God, I pray that we have followed and taken your leadership as we voted today to call Blaine Britt as our associate pastor. And we pray that whatever happens, that we would accept it as your will. And Father, I continue to pray not only for the nation of Ukraine, but all the other many nations around the world where turmoil is taking place. And I pray for our nation where it seems that we are constantly fussing and fighting, talking about what's wrong with someone else instead of seeing the good. Lord, how I pray that you would draw us together as a nation, that if we say that we're one nation under God, then help us to act like it. God, I pray now that you would continue to speak to us through this service. For I pray these things in Christ's powerful and precious name. Amen. We'll be reading from Luke 22, um, 24 through 27. An argument broke out among the disciples over which one of them should be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles rule over their subjects, and those in authority over them are called friends of people. But that's not the way it will be with you. Instead, the greatest among you must become like a person of lower st status and the leader like a servant. So which one is greater? The one who is seated at the table or one who serves at table? Isn't the, it the one who is seated at the table? But am, I am among you as one who serves.
Thank you so much, choir. But more than that, thanks to the man of sorrows who bore our sins to the cross. In some ways, it's hard for me to believe that this is the sixth Sunday of Lent. Seems not long ago that we were talking about Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem, preparing for his death. We looked at some of the time that he spent in the temple while he was in Jerusalem. And we have looked at some of his teachings. And today we will look at another of those. Because indeed he changed the world's perception of what is great. As Liz said in the children's time, there have been those who have claimed, made a claim of greatness. Muhammad Ali said, I, I am the greatest, and I said that even before I knew I was the greatest. There have been many over the years who have been called great. Alexander the Great, Catherine the Great, Frederick the Great, Peter the Great, Ramses the Great, and Wayne the Great One, Gretzky. And then Liz also talked about what a goat is. I have to be honest, when I first heard them talking about somebody being a goat, I didn't think that was a good thing. It wasn't when I was growing up. But come to find out, eventually I understood that they were trying to say that someone was the greatest of all time. But is there any way to actually say who is the greatest at anything? In basketball, was it Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Wilt Chamberlain or Bill Russell or the big O, Oscar Robinson? People have made arguments for each and every one of them. In football, was it Jim Brown, who had a very short career, but a very fantastic career? Walter Payton and Tom Brady. That's so hard for me to say. <laughs> but I have to admit that he's one of the greatest of all times because of his wins. And not just his wins, but also the number of times he's been to the Super Bowl. Some would argue that Serena Williams is the greatest woman of all times. Other would, others would argue Martina Navratilova. Navratilova. In men, some would say Roger Federer was the greatest. Some would say Novak Djokovic is now overtaking him and is the greatest. In gymnastics, is it Simone Biles or Nadia Kamenich? In swimming, is it Michael Spitz or Michael Phelps or Mark Spitz? Playing a trumpet, is it Wynton Marsalis or Pip? Easton. When it comes to science, is it Albert Einstein or Isaac Newton or Galileo that is the greatest? Or in math, is it Pythagoras or Carl Gauss or Rene Descartes? And when it comes to pitchers in baseball, is it Cy Young who won the most games of all time? Or my personal favorite, Bob Gibson, who had the lowest seasonal ERA of all time? Or Warren Spahn, many consider one of the great left-handers. Or Greg Maddox, I've never been a Braves fan for uh, a specific reason, but when Greg Maddox and John Glavin and John Smoltz and the other person that was on that staff were pitching, I recognized that that was one of the greatest pitching staffs of our time. And Maddox was good because he could nibble at the corners. Or was it Nolan Ryan who holds the record for the most strikeouts that he was able to get from the uh, people who were batting off of him? And then when you think about baseball players themselves, was it Babe Ruth, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, Hank Aaron, Ted Williams, Ty Cobb, or Willie Mays? And I'm sure many of you have other names that you might add there. I can guarantee you that Dennis Lester would say it's Mickey Mantle. But what about opera singers? Is it Luciano Pavarotti, Placide Domingo, 
Joan Sutherland or Mar Maria Callas. When it comes to playing a stringed instrument, is it Isaac Perlman, David Isaac, or Ida Handel, or Julia Fisher? Now, if you're like me, I did not know all of these people, but I looked and found some of the greatest people at everything. But no matter how we might talk about them being the greatest, we can never know for sure. There will all be, always be discussions. But what does Jesus have to say about what makes a person great? Does it have anything to do with the number of points or home runs or strikeouts or beautiful sounds that person has made with their voice or with an instrument? Those who have provided us mathematic and scientific, scientific discoveries? Does Jesus say this is what makes a person great? You and I both know that is not the case, is it? Because while they were sitting around together, some of the disciples began to argue with one another. If we look at one of the other uh, gospels, we will find they were arguing about who was going to get to sit next to Jesus, particularly on his right hand because that was the place of honor. They were arguing who is the greatest among us. Well, Philip should, <clears throat> could certainly count. Uh, Thomas, excuse me, could certainly be called the greatest doubter. Peter could be called the greatest put my foot in my mouth kind of guy. John could be seen as the one who truly loved like Christ loved. But as they were having this discussion, as they were arguing, what makes a person great? I don't know exactly how Jesus intervened in the situation but I'm sure he had listened to them for a while quietly and then he said to them basically let me put my dollars worth into the argument here and he said to them we see those who are seated at the places of honor those who are leaders in the religious field, in the governmental field, and other places. Those who have a lot of money and power. But are they really the ones who are great? He tells them, no. It's not the table, people at the table who are great, but the people who serve the table. Remember that when we go into a restaurant, that our waiters, our servers are doing a great deed and that we need to treat them with that kind of respect. But Jesus reminds them, if you want to be great, then you've got to become like the youngest. Now, when I was growing up, it was nothing compared to when Jesus uh, was in the, on the earth. But when I was growing up, we were told as children to be seen and not heard. Well, it was even more so in Jesus' day. Children were little more than property. And they were looked down upon. And so Jesus said, if you want to be great, become like a child. And I've always said children have a greater sense of the deciding about a person and what they're like than we as adults do because they have not been jaded. They have not made up, this is what I think. But instead, they simply see people for who they are and know how to accept them or not. But he also says, I did not come to be served. Now remember, he gave up his place at the right hand of the Father in heaven, which was the place of greatest honor. But he gave that up so that he could come and be a servant, a servant who would ultimately give his life on Calvary's cross. 
He said, this is what true greatness is. He didn't talk about himself, but he showed what true greatness was through the way that he lived his life. And so I ask you as I ask myself, and we have to be honest with ourselves, what is our concept of what great is? Is it based on the position a person holds in life? Do we see a person as being great simply because of the office they hold or the job that they have that's at the top of the company? Sometimes that's exactly the way we see it, isn't it? Or maybe it's based on the amount of money and possessions that someone has. With all the athletes that Liz had put on the picture earlier, every one of them have or had more money than all of us in this sanctuary combined, I would guess. Unless some of y'all are a lot richer than I know about. But does that make them great? They may be a great athlete in their sport, but that is not what Jesus said makes them great. Or maybe it's based on the power that other people weld on us or on others the influence that people try to have on others and we say, well, they have a great deal of influence. Jesus had more influence than anyone else and yet he did not use that as a way to coerce anyone. And so we need to think about our conception of great. Is it something else than what I have just said? Or is it what Jesus said makes a person great? Do we really believe what Jesus said? If you want to be great, become the least. If you want to be great, serve others. Don't expect to be served. We have not been taught that here in America or anywhere else in the world, I'm sure. So what was it? that made Jesus great, not just his teachings, but I want to suggest five or six things that made Jesus great. First of all, I believe Jesus was great because of his willingness to care about other people and to be concerned about their needs. We sometimes get so busy that we don't have time for others. You remember on more than one occasion when Jesus' disciples tried to get people to go away, that Jesus wasn't up to it, whether it be children or someone needing food or something else. And what did Jesus say on each occasion? I'm not too busy. I'm not too tired. I see that they have need and I have a concern for them. Because one of the things that I saw Jesus with the children is he made children a group that was important that he was not willing to step over them, but instead to place them in his lap. So Jesus was willing to care about others and to be concerned about their needs. And the question is, are we willing to do that as well? How concerned are we for the needs of other people? How much do we really care for people outside of our little world? But the second thing, and I have number one again, excuse me. But the second thing that made Jesus grace was his willingness to understand others and meet them where they are on the journey. In the last several years, 20, 30, 40 years, one of the things that I've observed in our nation is that we are unwilling to understand people who are different from us. It's our way or no way. But Jesus said, I'm going to take the time to get to know people. He was saying to us, I'm not going to look at their skin color. I'm not going to look at where they came from or how they got here. I'm not going to 
listen to the fact that they do not speak English and so I can't understand them. Jesus said, I'm going to seek to understand others. One of the posts that I made this week on Facebook was the Snoopy gang, Charlie Brown and the others. And it said, a smile in any language is the same. Even if we can't communicate with our words, we can communicate in a way that says, I accept you right where you are. And I have no doubt that if we would learn to do that, because one of the things that I see is that we all have a lot more in common than we have different from one another. But we have a tendency to focus on the differences instead of the likenesses. If we truly say we're a nation, one nation under God, then we need to act like it. And quit dividing ourselves and instead join together. But the third part, a third thing that Jesus did that made him great was his willingness to sacrifice his own needs for the needs of others. Jesus sacrificed his prayer time sometimes because the people were surrounding him. He sacrificed a lot of different things for other people. But most importantly of all, he sacrificed his life. He gave his life because you and I are sinners. And none of us are able to take care of our own sin problem. But Jesus knew that through the sacrifice of his life, through the giving of his life, that we might have an opportunity to be back in right relationship with God, to receive forgiveness for him if we simply confess our sins and place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died, was buried, and rose again. But a fourth thing is Jesus was willing to serve rather than to be served. What do you think would happen If you went into a restaurant and your waiter or waitress came to you and you said, have a seat. And then you said to them, what would you like? They first of all would look at at us like we were crazy. But that's the kind of attitude and spirit that Jesus had. There were times when he was hungry, but he was more concerned about the hunger of others, and he served them. There were times in which he was tired, but there were people who had needs, physical and otherwise, and he met those needs through his power of healing. He was willing to serve rather than having others serve him. On that Thursday night of Monday, Thursday, Jesus showed his willingness to serve because he took off his robe and he took a towel and a basin of water and he washed his disciples' feet. He served them rather than expecting them to serve him. But he also was great because his willingness to love others no matter what happened. When Jesus was put on trial, when he was beaten, when lies were told about him, how did he respond? Did he respond in anger and say, I'm going to get you for that? Or did he basically turn the other cheek and say, I forgive you? Because while he was on the cross, there were those who were mocking him and making fun of him, including one of the thieves on his side on another cross. And some of his last words here on earth were, Father, forgive them. Because they really don't understand what they're doing. Jesus got to know people, to understand people. And so he saw a different perspective. And I think we can love others when we begin to see them, not through our own eyes, 
but through the eyes of Jesus. Even though I don't listen to country music, it seems like I have a lot of illustrations from country music, but a number of years ago, there was a song entitled Rose Colored, Rose Colored Glasses, seeing everything through those glasses and seeing it as rosy. Well, I would say to you, look at the world through God-colored glasses. To see the world as God sees it. To see people as God sees it. And so we have to ask all of ourselves the question, will we follow the world's concept of what makes a person great? Or will we follow the example of Jesus Christ? To be truly great. I can't answer that question for you. I can only answer it for myself. But my prayer is that as Christians, as followers of God, that we would learn to humble ourselves as Jesus humbled himself. That we would learn how to be truly great by serving others, by caring about others, even if they're different from me. Because the truth of the matter is, God knows God knows your heart. God knows your mind. God knows your spirit. And he knows what you believe makes a person great. It's by the way that we act and the way that we live. Isn't that how Jesus showed his greatness? Let's go out and live and act like Jesus so that we can be great people and do what's right even when it's not easy. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to this time now, we thank you not only for the teachings of Jesus but also the example of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that each of us would examine our hearts and our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you might help each one of us strive to be great through service, to be great through humility, to be great through caring and being concerned, to be great by seeking to understand other people and what they're going through, to seek to be great by loving as you loved us. For I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is the old rugged cross. If God is speaking, won't you respond as we stand together and sing. This time I'll turn it back over to Brenda and then we'll have our benediction. You may be seated.
Lord, as we bow before you, I again pray that you might help us to go out and be great representatives of you. And I pray, Father, for those who might have been opposed to it, that they would now join together and say, this is your will. I pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct us as we move forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.